but we also knew it was also important that the movie not be about a bomb. And so, yes, right. it, everyone's waiting for it to go off and, you know, screw you, uh, uh, people who think you can predict what's going to happen in this movie. It's not <laughs> going to go off ever. All right, we're going to launch into a few um, a few of those trivia facts from IMDb. And, and these are, feel free to just do true or false if you want to elaborate or have a, have a particular story that, that one of these bring up, feel free. The first, uh, the first fact is, fact, John Travolta asked the writers if they were making fun of him with the ridiculous chin line, and they explained that, that Castor was such a narcissist that he would hate having anyone else's face. True. Nice. That scene was about to be shot and we were summoned to uh, JT's trailer to discuss that line. Our response was, John, look, you are without question one of the most famously handsome men on earth. The audience knows that. But inside, you're not John Travolta with the famous cleft chin and all that. You are Caster Troy, and Caster Troy, as you guys just said, is an excessive narcissist and believes he is the best looking person on earth. And so this face does not suit him. And so <laughs> when you say that line, we're pretty sure the audience is going to be laughing with you and not at you. Right. And, and Michael, what did John say after we pitched that to him? Yeah, you know, he 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 got it. He, you know, I, I mean, I think he got what I think he knew what we were. He certainly knew what we were going for, but he wasn't 100 percent sure. Oh, okay. Come that's, on. That's Ch- right. Chin up, buddy. Yeah. Chin up. <laughs> well, All, right. Chin up. <laughs> All right. So the second one here, true or false, the scene with Adam listening to over the rainbow on his uh, headphones was John Woo's idea and not part of the original script. True or false? Uh, that's, that's true. That's totally true. Yeah. Okay. John originally wanted uh, one little tiny sidebar on this. The, the, what John wanted to use was Puff the Magic Dragon. Uh. And, um, and apparently uh, the producer came down grumbling one day, shaking his head in disbelief because he, he said the Peter, Paul and or Mary, whoever controlled the rights to it, wouldn't wouldn't license the rights because he still believed that that he could get a movie made of the song one what? day, even though the, <laughs> even though it was 30 years old. And who knows, maybe he will. But they were very hey. put out by that. And then they couldn't get the Judy Garland version either. So yeah, the Judy Garland estate would not license it for this. Uh, violent movie. I guess they must have sent the script or something. It was, it was serendipitous to have Olivia Newton John singing yeah. on a John, another John Travolta film. Was, yeah, uh, I know. We we love that circle. imagery too. Yeah, <laughs> it was it was good. But that's true. Yeah, right. Writers and symmetry. It's like uh, uh, if anything gets a writer off, it's symmetry. It's it's nice, like you know, circling yeah. back and. Yeah. Yeah. The studio wanted John Woo to take the slash out of the title, but he kept it in because he didn't want people to think it was a hockey movie. Is that mine, Michael? Yes, that's yours. Take it away. (laughs) I thought so. Okay. So when we came up with the idea that that would be the name of the film and we simultaneously to that put the slash in, we were always terrified that they were going to take the slash out which was always a problem for us because it just seemed weird. And the whole concept was so weird. So Mm -hmm. we went behind the scenes uh, while we were in prep for like a fucking year, I guess. Uh, And we went to, you know, because we were now working on doing rewrites on the lot. We had our own trailer. We went to the production designer, the cinematographer, the costume department, publicity, and we just because a couple times, a few times memos had come out and the slash wasn't in there. It was either a hyphen or just two words. And sometimes with the word off, not even capitalized. So um, so we went to every department and we complained quietly to all of them, insisting that the slash be put in because we wanted to inoculate everyone to the idea. We wanted mm-hmm. everyone to get used to it. Well, sure. Then came time the, the, the uh, we were shooting. It was a six month shoot and we were shooting the movie and there were um, there were 
uh, rumblings from the head heads of the studio that it, we couldn't do it, that the wow. slash was confusing, that uh, marquees, uh, movie marquees, uh, this is before, I guess, Nip Tuck and Crazy Beautiful and whatever. Yeah. Um, th that didn't exist. They couldn't put it sideways. So uh, I did you was it I was not there. No, this was you solo. I was summoned into a meeting <laughs> where it was me against like 10 people at Paramount <laughs> asking me to defend this slash. By the way, there's an article in Entertainment Weekly, things we learned this summer. And that slash, I think, is in there uh, as an article. But uh, yeah, so I was summoned in there. Michael, for some reason, couldn't be there. And I went on and on about metaphors and J Joseph Campbell and and how the it's it's sort of a uh, it's it's yin yang and it's it's the slash is separating like a dagger separating good and evil, et et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I wasn't winning anybody over. And then finally, <laughs> I just like put my hands up in the air and said, look, without that slash, people are going to think this is a hockey movie. That's all it took. Oh, we uh, could lose money. Uh, we <laughs> could lose. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes, now you're talking their language. <laughs> and then, of course, there was the whole issue during production where we heard rumblings that the studio wanted to change the name of the movie altogether away from Face Off into something like Doppelganger or something. Sound and like it wasn't forward. just for the German market. Good. We, again, went behind the scenes while we were shooting the loft action sequence. Is that right, Michael? Yeah, yeah. Well, this, yeah this is Mike, Michael, you take over on this. Well, well, uh, Mike, you'll have to jump in if I forget something. So it, as it just by coincidence, we got to started hearing the rumblings that they were wanted to change the title. And we were on the set and um, they were shooting all that stuff. And so, of course, all the all the actors were there. And somehow it came up in front of Nicolas Cage. That no, we they, went to him. Oh, we went to. OK, there you go. That that explains it that they were wanting to change the title. And <laughs> Nicolas Cage said and this is on the set like they're about to shoot. And Nicolas Cage said, don't worry, after this, after tonight, we didn't know what he was talking about, because after tonight, they won't be able to change the title. And we were like, uh, OK. And he goes on. And sh that was the night he shot that scene where he's on drugs with Nick goes, Cassavetes. I'd like to take his his face. off. I wish there those footage still existed because that went on for well, like 10 minutes, 10 minutes. <laughs> 10 minutes. Hammer rolling. John Rue just loved it and just let them go at it. Face off, face off, face off, my face off, your face off. I mean, they just had a blast riffing on all of that. And of course, only a little tiny part of it remains in the movie. But once he did that, that was it. They just they just committed to it. We never heard it again. <laughs> it's always <laughs> fun for writers to bury, you know, kind of bury the title into your dialogue. Um, yeah. I, I finally watched Nightmare Alley last night and they do it very quietly. Um, but uh, I mean, it's buried in a longish speech. Yeah. If, if you could sneak in a good roll credits moment, that that's always fun. Yeah. We, we had it right up there. Uh, Nick I, H. I'm just sure it, Mike. it was in your face. <laughs> I'm yeah. just the whole in, my mind. In, this, I just... in the script, he only says it like once. Mm -hmm. And then they kind of think he's weird and they sort of move on. But Nick just made a big meal out of it. Nick has Why, do this well, happening? Why do I see this happening this way? They go up to Nicolas Cage. They, he found out that they were going to change the name. He's like, oh, yeah, that, watch this. You know what I'm saying? Like you gave him that motivation so that that's pretty that's pretty dope, guys. Now, let me ask you this. There has been some jokes online about I even said it in our review of the film, which you guys haven't seen yet. Mike Werb joked that the bomb had the longest lag time slash latency in movie history, just long enough to keep the plot going. <laughs> I feel like that's true. <laughs> when did I joke about that? I, I we we said that, but I don't remember when I said it. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, I, IMDb's got your phone tapped. There. <laughs> well, that's the to, back to the point we talked about earlier. Totally true. That we knew we needed something huge to motivate someone removing their face and getting replaced with the serial killer, the killer of your your uh, son, you know, of your child. And mm -hmm. so, uh, so we knew that was important, but we also knew it was also important that the movie not be about a bomb. And so, yes, right. everyone's waiting for it to go off. 
and you know, screw you, uh, uh, people who think you can predict what's going to happen in this movie. It's not going to go off ever. John finally got to dance. You know, he was up for that dancing scene. John was having the time of his life dismounting that bomb. He was oh, just yeah. like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yep. Oh, I think he had said his contract. He's got to dance in every movie, at just least for a little bit, just once a little. Time. Time. He does it again when he's. Uh, First meets Janie, i.e. Jamie, his daughter. And oh my god. Got she... a brand new bag. And yeah. we loved when he did that. Oh, he was you got something I want. Actor. We were so delightful on set. Very yeah. sweet people. So they had a problem with the name of the film. They didn't have a problem with a grown man pretending to lean over to what he thought was his daughter, or she thought that was her dad, reaching over to get a cigarette with her in her underwear. They had no problem with that. Well, yeah. another another defying expectations there because we see him fondling that chorus, that girl in the choir at the very beginning, and it's yes. the same character inside. And so you think that, but nope, we flip it. He's actually, and they they have a bonding moment right away. Not you know, it's 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 horrible in that it's sort of sexually charged what you're expecting him to do no mm -hmm. he wants a cigarette from her don't tell mom so now they have a secret and he it's Great part it's the first man. step in him being a better father uh than the distant man that she's known her whole life thank you from uh, the writer thank you i have to say uh, the word, this is off topic from the segment rain but i just i don't want to forget it this, you guys did such an excellent job when you I, when you're talking about the son dying and wearing the face of the person that killed your son. You did such a great job of setting it like a great movie relies on great stakes that are set up effectively. And you guys did such a good job with that, with with just setting up this nightmare situation. Looks like you're going to be in here for the next hundred years. <laughs> that you just long for the the good guy to escape from and make things right. Really good. The script, and, and this I think is actually, you, you brought this up before, the script that's presented to John Woo was set in the future, but Woo suggested changing the setting to the present to focus on the dramatic and psychological elements of the storyline. Um, I know you guys said it was set in the future, but was that was that um, at John Woo's uh, like suggestion to, to bring it to yes, the present? Yes, I do. Okay, so 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 this this requires a little unpacking, a truth telling. Yeah, a little a little truth telling. So so the, the original script that we sold again because we were so nervous about the face swap aspect of it, we wrote a movie that was very futuristic, a hundred years in the future, it had a lot of other futuristic elements that made it literally unproducible or or like the most expensive movie ever made. But we still set it up at Warner Brothers and it, it didn't really go anywhere. It didn't go anywhere at Warner Brothers. We did our drafts and they really weren't. That's another topic. But it ended up sort of like sitting there for a couple of years while the option was running out. And in those couple of years, we had a lot of time to talk about it. We had a lot of time to talk about what we would have done differently, what would be better, what would be more commercial. We just rummaged around for a while about it. And in that time, we thought, you know what? We 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 did, we overdid it. We kind of overthought this. We we really don't need. We didn't need to do be so far flung. We could have done this as a secret program. The more realist real it was, the better it was going to be. So instead of hiding the idea, we want we you know we we thought we should really just embrace it and go at it from a real personal point of view, and we'll get better actors that way anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. So once we got the option back and we set it up at Paramount and we had a meeting with their producers, we went in and they said, this ne also never happened in our whole life. They, they were like, what do you guys want to do with this? Yeah, you know, we've Warner, had Warner Brothers had repeatedly when, you know, look, Joel Silver is his incredible track record producing movies. But it was basically the notes from from Silver Pictures were. You know, uh, you know, action scene, uh, glass uh, crashes right. every ten pages. And it, and when we met with Steve Ruther and Michael Douglas, who produced the film uh, with David Permit, the, it was literally we were like Michael just said we were kind of blown away by uh, it was Michael Douglas I think who said I've read every draft. What what tell me the story that you guys want to tell. And then he was like, we don't need all this futuristic stuff. Yeah, we said we want to get rid of all that because for so many reasons. And and they got very excited, too, because they were like they were afraid to bring that up. Like we were going to be resistant, not that they couldn't have replaced us. 
But when we said, the first thing we said was, look, I, we know what you bought, but we want to get rid of all that. We want to focus on the people. We, you know, we want to make it more intimate. And they were like, yeah, great, go. That's what we want too. Um, well, didn't, didn't Michael Douglas say, yeah, because you know what, guys? This is a, this is a psychological thriller disguised as an action movie. Right. And he goes, I'm a producer on this, on this movie, but if I'm putting my actor's hat on, I'm telling you this. Actors get to play good and evil in the same movie when it's identical twins. You guys have an opportunity to, to get great actors because it's not identical twins. It's something else. Yeah. It's something we've mm-hmm. never seen before. And uh, this is more of an Edgar Allan Poe uh, kind of story, he said. So, so yeah. So flash right? forward. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So flash forward. The movie's made. John Wu makes the movie. And after the movie, we see an article from John saying uh, that he was the one who cook out all the futuristic stuff, which he and we were like, huh? He never, ever saw a draft of all the futuristic stuff from our point of view, because it was all gone by the time he came on the movie. Well, we asked his partner, producing partner, Terrence Chang, who's been with him forever. And Terrence started to laugh and explained that back, we didn't, we never knew this, but back when the script was at Warner Brothers in the early 1991, Joel Silver went to Hong Kong with a stack of all his scripts, because that was the moment when Hong Kong cinema was starting to kind of get to be better known worldwide. And so Joel Silver, as Mike says, brilliant producer said, oh, I'm going to get me a great Chinese director. And he went to Hong Kong with all his scripts that were in development. And he was basically saying, John Wu, I've seen A Better Tomorrow. You can direct any of these you want. And he read Face Off. We didn't know that. John had read Face Off back before we ever met him. And it was completely futuristic. And he said, I like this but it's too futuristic. Well, we never, that never filtered down to us. You know, Joel Silver, I'm sure never even remembered. But when John got the script again in 1994, it, all that stuff was out. He was like, oh, they took my note. That's a, that, I, that's, that's funny, but that's like a perfect, uh, that, that's a perfect example of the synergy between the writers and directors. So anyway, so that explained why John, and to this day probably still takes credit for taking the futuristic stuff out of the movie. But it was, again, it was like you say, it was synchronicity. You, you guys were on the same page even before you were in the same library. Yeah, yeah. In an early draft of the script, Archer went to Castor's mother's place to hide out. The writers <laughs> wanted the mother to be played by Elizabeth Taylor or Jack Nicholson in drag. True or false? True. True. All true. Absolutely. We Those were the two actors we were very keen on on playing that role. And it ended up, uh, there was just no room for that scene or that sequence. But we really felt like it would be, it ended up being turning into the loft sequence, but having nowhere else to turn, we thought it was, and we still believe it would have been amazing to have him because the whole movie, as you guys have noted several times in this conversation is about balance and counterbalance. Mm -hmm. And so having nowhere else to turn, having escaped Erewhon prison, he has, he's hunted, the most hunted man on earth. Where does he go? He goes to Castor's mother's house where she is a very strange person uh, who I think in one of the drafts has, has a incestuous relationship with her son. Um, but, but he spends the night in his nemesis's uh, uh, bedroom, which has oh, not yeah. changed, so yeah. has not changed since high school, since you know, since he lived there. And so, our hero gets insight not just in the behavior of this horrible mother, but also the totems of Castor Troy's childhood. And we learn a lot of backstory about who he was and why he became what he became. Unfortunately, it's not in the film, but you know, it helped us inform everything about him anyway, but yeah, that's, that's exactly, that's exactly correct. And we went through through different versions of what the mother was like, but yeah, it did not, it unfortunately fell out of the script at a certain point. We did hear in script magazine, we got interviewed by like script magazine or something like that. 
And um, the person who interviewed us had recently somehow, she knew Jack Nicholson or, or had a meeting with him. And she actually, she told us, oh, I told Jack Nicholson that uh, you guys wanted him to play the mother, Travolta's mother, uh, Castro Troy's mother in drag. And he got a big kick out of it, apparently. He, got, he thought that was freaking hilarious. So, uh, but, um, so that would have been fun. Here's a question for you guys. Can you guess what Castro Troy's mother's first name is or was in our script? I'm sure you can guess. One guess each. Damn it. I did not know he was going to do yeah, this too. And now that's... Okay. Oh, all did right. you get our memo of questions we were going to ask you? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I am going to... Uh, Jackie. Oh, very good. But I'll wrong. say... Uh, <laughs> shit. That was, uh, that's all I had. On. I feel uh, my, my head just got... All right, hot. I'll give you a clue. <laughs> think... Continue to think Greek mythology. Medusa. No. Oh, well, that's <laughs> a good guess. It is a good guess. Uh Helen. Helen, Helen, of Troy. Helen of Troy. Oh, oh damn it. it. Damn it. I love Greek mythology. Damn it. I really like the idea that like uh, what makes a great antagonist is when you tempt the audience to uh, to feel bad for them or at least to to understand them. And I could see the I could see why scenes like that would have been. And like you said, that putting a magnifying glass on the contrast between the two. Characters. Can you imagine going in that bedroom that they were talking about having and seeing the two bunk beds from Caster and his brother? Like there's like this whole thing is taking another that that that. Guys, I wish they would have let you keep that. We need a writer's cut. Fuck a director's cut. We need writer's cut. <laughs> yeah, <movies>. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Now, the writer cited White Heat and Seconds as influences on the plot. But I heard you earlier in the interview say that you guys didn't see Seconds to like way after this. Is, is this yeah, correct or no? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Because I didn't want to dispel that rumor because sometimes people will see, see stuff and say, oh, man, they took that from that. Like, no, people have ideas all the time. So, you know, you got to put them on paper and everything. So Seconds is a great film, by the way. It's an amazing movie. But, yeah, it was not it was not on our radar at all. No. Uh, Although my father what? did run into John Frankenheimer and uh, who said he really liked the movie. <laughs> Did I tell, ever tell you that, Michael? No, I don't know. What did he, did he, Frankenheimer like the movie? Yeah, my father had, a, ha, maybe she's still a client. My father has a, had a client who had a, a post-production house in Santa Monica. And Fra Frankenheimer was in post on one of his last movies. And he, saw, he really liked the film. Oh, it's great. Yeah, anyway. That's cool. cool. The, uh, the last uh, fact here is... Um, INDB states that Nicolas Cage considers Face Off to be one of his, uh, or his, actually just his favorite film that he's worked on. Provided that that is true, how does that, how would that make you guys feel to know that you penned the 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 script for Nicolas Cage's favorite film? And I'm like, of all the actors to make that statement, I feel like it's more complimentary coming from Nicolas Cage because he's made like he he's he's comparing this to like three thousand other films. Yes. This year, five thousand. Thank you. There yeah. you go. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, man is working. Well, I, I had never heard that before. Of course, I'm. I had neither. And flattered if he felt that way. I will say this: shooting the film itself, the production of the film itself, which was, as Mike said, was six months long, is very difficult. It was a very happy, harmonious set. Um, John, they, they, John, both John Travolta and Nicolas Cage worshipped John Woo. John Woo was, is, um, you know, he was just the rock at the center of all of this kind of like chaotic storm. The production was, was very, very smooth. I mean, look, there's always money issues and stuff like that, but there was no ego around these guys. Uh, they were given latitude to create with John. They, you know, they felt included in the creation part of it. They were given freedom to do their thing. John Lo Wu loves actors. He loved them. Um, it, it was just, it was for a movie of that size and that complexity and that much money. Um, it was, it was weirdly bereft of tension and anxiety. There was never like the studio coming down and screaming and stopping production. Mm -hmm. There was none of that. And um, so that was, I think, very, uh, very helpful. And I think part of that reason, the main reason of that was because of course, Travolta and Cage were happy. 
They were happy yeah. on the set. They felt taken care of. They they felt very connected to John Woo and heard. But the other, I think, important part was there were no rewrites. There was no chaos around the script. The script, well, other the script. than the climax, but yeah. yeah, I mean, we had to do some some changes around block, you know, production issues. We had but thirteen like, days to shoot the climax, yeah, and uh, we they one day they came to us and we had to cut it down to five. Wow. Yeah, so so there were challenges like that, but it wasn't like every day these guys were getting new scenes and new pages, you know, that were taking the store that they had no insight where they yeah. came from. There wasn't any of that. So it was a very stable, for a movie of that size, it was a very sort of stable undertaking. And since most people still didn't understand it, we were required to be on set at all times. 